Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the Sounds True Foundation. The goal of the Sounds True Foundation is to provide access and eliminate financial barriers to transformational education and resources, such as teachings and trainings on mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion. If you'd like to learn more and join with us in our efforts, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Sharon Salzberg. Sharon is a beloved meditation teacher and a New York Times bestselling author. She's the co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, the host of the Meta Podcast, and she's created several audio meditation guides and courses with Sounds True, along with being a wisdom teacher featured as part of Sounds True's Inner MBA program, where she teaches on loving kindness at work. For Sharon, the practice of meditation and inner inquiry are deeply connected to working on real change in the world. Here she talks about what it means to wholly give our hearts to what we care the most about in actions we can take right now. Here's a whole lot of wisdom from Sharon Salzberg. Sharon, I'm so happy to have this chance to talk to you about your book that came out a couple of years ago, Real Change, Mindfulness to Heal Ourselves and the World. I think real change is what is on the hearts of many, many people right about now. Tell me a little bit for you what the precursors were, what was the inspiration to write Real Change? I think it came... uh largely from two groups that I felt very close to that I often work with teaching meditation. Uh, one was what we call caregivers. You know, it's people who care for people or animals or whatever, people who are often on kind of the front lines of suffering and bearing a burden that the rest of us are nicely avoiding, you know, in some way and often don't even want to look at or acknowledge. And, uh, I just had such tremendous admiration for these people and they ranged the people I got to be with from domestic violence, shelter workers to hospice nurses, to international humanitarian aid workers, to parents, to people taking care of their parents and uh, to managers who were actually sort of caregiving their staff. And um, there were some, or even people who in friendships and relationships tend to take that role you know, the giver, the the person who's offering, sometimes having a hard time receiving. And and uh, I just really felt close to these people. And I thought, well, you know, these particular techniques, these methods of, of meditation practice have supported me all these years, you know, and so many of the projects I was involved in, involved in were seeing if they could be of support to others in that kind of high stress work. And and the other people were just kind of the people who would come to learn meditation. And I saw a progression very genuinely through the years of how doing any kind of meditation, introspection, contemplative practice would really open people's hearts and they would genuinely become kinder and and more compassionate. And the uh, the example I use all the time is you know, people would say to me things like, I was out on the street, I was taking a walk, and somebody came up to me and asked me for some money. And I gave them a dollar, because that's my habit. I just always give a dollar. But it was the first time I ever looked that person in the eye and realized that was a human being, just like me. And I've heard some iteration of that story over and over again. But I also saw those people not taking another step and maybe reflecting like what's the housing policy in the city I live in that there's so many people living on the streets or what does the system look like that's supposed to be supporting people, helping them get off the streets or, um, you know, so the human relationship was growing, but not that sense of kind of a larger view of society and how change can 
can really happen. And so it was both those groups of people that I thought, well, uh, here's the book, you know, and I was very, I was very passionate about writing it. And that comes through, I have to say, of all your books, I'm going to nominate Real Change. I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to vote right now. I think it might be my favorite uh, uh, of all of your books. I, well, I love thank you. I mean, so that much. would be really sad if the first was a favorite. It was all downhill from then. That's Although right. I've done no. some for you. They were really good, too. I know. I know that your books keep getting better and better. Okay. I pulled out five themes from the book that I thought we could talk about that were particularly meaningful to me and that are really in, in many ways kind of the backbone of the book. The first one has to do with what you call the stirring of agency. And I wanted to start there for that person who's listening, who says, you know, I don't feel that powerful in the world today. I don't feel like I have that much agency in the world today. It's great to talk about change makers. There's some mythic other person over there. I'm kind of flat out right now. I feel overwhelmed. Well, I think it's such a common feeling and it's episodic too. I mean, as you and I speak, I think it's, it's really high, you know, like uh, the world just seems again to be falling apart. And one of the ironies about this book Real change was that it came out in the middle, of, not even in the middle, it came out at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you know, when everything was sort of lending itself to the feeling of shut down and can't do anything. And, and as I say in the book, one of my icons in life is the Statue of Liberty. And what I hadn't really realized so much until working on the book was that she's a woman on the move. She's in mid stride, like. One of her legs is halfway up. One of her feet is halfway up. And uh, that symbolizes a lot to me, you know, that even getting to the place where she, as an icon, is representing welcome, like you have a home here, even you that no one else wants, even you can have a home here, but she's doing, she's active. And, and that reminds me over and over again to do the small thing that's in front of me. It seems like nothing seems like nothing could ever happen, but it matters. And um, I, I think it's really significant. I think we, we do have agency. Uh, we can rewrite the story of our day so that it represents our values. You know, instead of at work, for example, only being interested in the sale, you know, or, or whatever the metric is, also being interested in, like, how – might that person have felt in conversation with me? Yeah. You know, yeah. what am I really relaying here? Well, what's interesting is when, when you talk about this stirring of agency and being mid stride, you talked about our day today, the small things. And I think sometimes when we feel hopeless or whatever, it's, it's like we're in some bigger, huge, you know, story that we've created instead of what's right in front of us. So it's interesting to me that you brought it back down to what's mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. in front of us. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just real. I mean, speaking of the word real, you know, which is uh, my perpetual book title these days, real this or real that. Um, I think that that's a crucial distinction because we can all be in admiration of some way of life we will never attain or, um, think of it as something relevant in days of old when saints walked among <laughs> them, you know, but not for me. And, and the most important thing of all is that it be real, our values, the way we live, um, the choices that we get to make that, that, yeah. that really be coherent. Okay. So if, if real is your, your word right now, what does it mean to you? What does real that word mean to you? It means whole or integrated to me that, uh, you know, it's not, we're not sort of affecting a persona that isn't going deep in, in any way and that we're not um, lost in kind of the uh, sort of mindless perfectionism that is so much a part of structure of of society so that we're, we're never really working with what is. We're just belittling ourselves, you know, for what isn't. You write about how the Statue of Liberty is this uh, yeah. image that you like so much. Do you have like a bunch of Statue of Liberty uh, paraphernalia all strewn around your apartment? Is that is that how it goes, Sharon? 
I do. I'm actually speaking to you from my house in Barry, Massachusetts. And yeah, this is not a visual medium or I pick up the Statue of Liberty that is just behind me over there. Right. And they're all, you know, they're odd. They're green, the rubbery things, you know, often. But I was tempted for a while in, in New York City. Um, my apartment is on the second floor with windows out to a very busy street. And I was tempted to get kind of a lot, uh, not life size for her, but life size for a human being replica and put it in the window so as people would go by on the second floor of a double decker bus, they would like go, oh, here's the Statue of Liberty. Uh, now, as a modern archetype, you've talked about being mid stride. Yes. What else is it about the Statue of Liberty that uh, has turned you into a collector here? A <laughs> collector, right? <laughs> my fine, my fine collection. <laughs> Um, well, of course it's the compassion and it is that sense of inclusion. You know, it's not like, eh, you know, not you so much, go back home, you know, like, but even you, and if not for your sake, for the sake of your children, for the sake of your lineage, you know, like, come, you can't have, have a home here. I think it was the most stunning statement I've ever heard in my life. Like, yeah, you can belong to even you. Mm-hmm. Okay, the second theme that uh, I'd like to highlight, transforming anger to courage. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how we can harness the energy of anger. And I want, if you would, Sharon, talk directly to that person who right now is feeling quite a bit of anger at something that's going on in the world. How do they mm -hmm. harness that energy? Uh, well, part of what I wrote about and what I tried to write about throughout was really people because they're real, you know, and I've learned so much from people, say activists, um, who I really equate with caregivers that I was speaking about before when I thought, who's like those people? I thought, oh, activists. And uh, I use a lot of reference to this woman, Malika Dutt, in, in that chapter, who's now a friend of mine. We met when we were just put on a panel together at some event. And she's a, a tremendous advocate against violence against women and has been for a long time, ever since she she uh, is uh, Indian American. She lives part-time in India and, and she was in India and a friend of hers was in a car accident or something like that and was put in the hospital where in India, a family really comes often to take care of you. and. And uh, the only bed they had left, they had open in the hospital, was in the burn unit. So she was taking care of her friend in the burn unit, and she saw a lot of women who were there because of violence against them, you know, their husband, their mother-in-law, something like that. And 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 it just turned her life around. And and she she was so infuriated, so enraged. And what she said on this panel was, "But I don't know how to dial it down." Like, I don't know how to turn it off. And and she said, you see it in all of our organizations, the way we speak to one another, the backbiting that's going on, the enmity that gets that gets shown. She said, I just can't go on in this way. And so, you know, she ended up leaving the organization, although she's still, you know, a tremendous advocate. And she sort of studied shamanism and she became a meditator. And it was like, uh, and she's coming from everything in, in a very different way now. So. I think the first thing is that we have to honor what we feel. We can't sort of put ourselves down for the, the rage or whatever it is. And just to start honestly saying, I feel what I feel. Um, and then to take something of an interest in the feeling, because if we have just a little bit of space, like if you're meditating, let's say, and the anger arises, rather than being consumed with what I'm angry about and what I'm going to do about it and how shameful it is that I feel it or how fantastic it is I feel it. It's just like, what is anger? Like, what do I feel in my body? And what's the, the movie of anger? Like, Just watch it play out. Watch the thoughts, watch the emotions. And what we see is that it's a very complex thing, that it's not just one feeling. There's a lot of sadness in there often, a lot of grief, um, a lot of frustration, a lot of um, fear. And I think virtually always we will see there is some sense of helplessness in there. And anger is what we pick up. They say this in Tibetan uh, Buddhism. 
Anger is what we pick up when we feel weak because we think it's going to make us strong. Hmm. That's a very powerful insight. Yeah. Yeah. And the strong part of it is the energy. You know, we're not passive. We're not complacent. You know, we're on the move. It's like we've got this energy. We're stirred. That's good. But um, in the Buddhist psychology, they say anger is like a forest fire, which can burn up its own support. It can destroy the host, which is us. We try to grab the energy, you know, um, without all the associated tunnel vision and sense of hopelessness and all of that. And that, that's how we channel it. So when I get there myself, if I'm sitting, and that's my experience, and I get to see that place of helplessness, that's my signal. Do just one thing. You know, make one call, write one letter, talk to one person, whatever. It, it seems like nothing, but it's the thing to do. And then that's the beginning of, of that flow of energy into action. It's really helpful, Sharon. Can you give me uh, an example for you of something that historically you felt really angry about and how you worked with that energy to take actions? Uh, I'm sure there are many. Um, in, again, in the Buddhist psychology, anger and fear are considered the same mind state, just two forms, anger being the expressive, energized, outward form. Fear being the sort of shrunken, frozen, imploding form. So I tend to get more frightened than angry overtly. You know, that that would be kind of a stronger thing. So then I have to sit with the fear and sort of find the anger within the fear and find, you know, everything else within that. But, um, you know, I, I think that I, I've sort of learned to modulate my consumption of media, for example. And um, I could say that, you know, I had a childhood with, a great many secrets in it. And so uh, probably the most sort of triggering or activating kind of environment for me is one where I feel I'm being lied to or there's there's something that I'm not being told, you know, and that my inner reality is not being supported. My inner perception of reality is not being supported by what I'm told. And um, so I saw... You know, when I watch certain politicians, for example, certain political leaders on, on TV, and I can tell they're just not speaking the truth. It's just like it's a bad environment for me, you know, and that I realize that I have to uh, not just stay there, you know, uh, in in my um, experience, inner experience, but both modulate my taking in of media and deciding in what form that would be most useful for me. And also recognize that I, I have agency. I'm an adult. I can go check things out myself. You know, I don't have to be in the stew of like, I don't know what's real, you know? <laughs> um, and, and that's important, you know, like find out for yourself, investigate and don't doom scroll, which is my favorite new term of the, century. Um, don't just keep reading the same story again and again and again and again, or listening to the same press conference again and again and again and again. You, you really have to moderate it. You know, it, it seems to me in, in listening to you talk about stirring of agency in our experience and here transforming anger, this feeling of helplessness Mm -hmm. underneath the anger. So I want to be strong that it requires a certain amount of um, perseverance, creative thinking, willingness to see what could I do? Mm -hmm. Like, is there mm -hmm. any point of power here, any point of action I can mm -hmm. take? Mm -hmm. And that sometimes we don't get there. Like instead mm -hmm. we just, we'd rather just rail mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. you know, in our anger or, talk about how helpless we feel, but that you're really describing something else, which is, no, we're actually going to make real change. We're going to find mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. step. Help that person who says, you know, and sometimes when I look out, I don't see the step. I don't see the step I can take. I don't see it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's an awfully hard path to do well alone. I mean, that sometimes really does require a, a kind of community or, and you have to feel empowered, you know, you don't have to join every group or or every action, you know, but um, kind of suss out what seems 
at least for now, most where you want to put your energy. And, and also there's the recognition, as sad as it is sometimes, that you can't do everything. You know, and that there are certain things. It's funny because I'm doing my taxes right now and uh, going over like all my um, charitable contributions for the last year. And you can see the waves. It's like, oh, those are all refugee organizations. <laughs> it's like, oh, those are all like literacy organizations. Like, oh, those are all, you know, as time went by in different months. And uh, we just moved in different ways. And, and we don't necessarily have the ability to do everything at all. And so we we choose. And, and often that choice is, I think, because we're not going to be alone in that in that endeavor. Mm -hmm. In writing about transforming anger to courage, you talk about the realization you had at a certain point that some things are more than a one generation fix. Yes. Yeah. How did that perspective uh, impact you and inform you? How does it inform you? I think it really um, it certainly opens the door to a kind of a different sort of patience. You know, it's a little bit like when I lived in Asia and the perspective was like often culturally that the, one lifetime is a blip. You know, it's like an in-breath and an out-breath. It's like, don't be in such a hurry. It's not going to all change in such a hurry. It was a little bit like that, you know, standing in uh, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, um, Yad Vashem, or, uh, and realizing this is not a one generation fix or seeing some of what was happening between groups in, in Paris, um, you know, with Arab youth and Parisians. And, and uh, you know, the story that's in the book is about a uh, uh, the cousin of a friend of mine, and my friend happened to be in France when I was there, and so we were at our cousin's house um, talking about, you know, his antipathy uh, towards some of that youth and then realizing, you know, their parents were kind of brought over here by my parents' generation with the promise of the earth, you know, you interpreted for us and, you know, those lands and you helped us and we're going to take care of you. And I didn't take care of them at all. And so there was tremendous betrayal and um, humiliation and all kinds of things. And, and I realized, oh, you know, the seeds of this are not like yesterday. This, this didn't happen uh, in terms of origin yesterday. It's going to be a while like for this. Mm -hmm. So Sharon, help me understand how, how, when you hear people say, this is the most critical decade we've ever been in. Humanity's fate lies in the decisions we make right here in the next 10 years. Uh, you know, normally I hear people talk about this in terms of climate change mm -hmm. with that kind of intensity. Mm -hmm. And then I hear, well, you know, this is more than a one generation fix. The roots of these problems are so deep. It's going to take many, many, many generations to fix these things. How do you put those two things together for yourself? Well, I think, first of all, you have to start somewhere. It's like, even if it's going to take many generations. Um, and um, don't put it off, you know, and don't think it's up to someone else. But um, when I was working with one of the people who runs a domestic violence shelter, she said, in terms of her own work, she said, I've had to learn the difference between something that is like critical in something that's actually an emergency. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we can have urgency without panic <laughs> and, and, and realizing that it just doesn't happen. Sometimes I just say to myself, okay, what can you do? You know, what can, what can you do right now? And um, it, it can come down to what seems like very small things, but it's actually doing and, and that it's that movement and, I think that's why um, I wrote that book, Faith, all those years ago, you know, because for me, faith meant getting off the sidelines right into the center of possibility. It's like, instead of saying, oh, that's a great book, I'll buy it for my cousin. It's saying, I want to see what would happen for me if I tried this out. 
Now, uh, Sharon, say more about this. I think most people, when they hear a word like faith, think that that's the time you kick back in the chair. Right. Yeah. And you're like, I'm just yeah. going to leave it to, you know, divine intelligence to work yeah. all this out. You're offering a very different perspective on faith. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it's, I think it's very much in line with the Buddhist tradition, you know, where he talked about faith as the, uh, um, offering your heart or giving over your heart. So it's like a verb and it's um, a progression. You know, it might start out with kind of being dazzled by somebody or, you know, a teacher or a place or just that incredible opening of like, wow, life's so much bigger than I thought it was. But that's considered just the beginning. And there's lots of stages of like verifying things through your own experience and doubting and wondering and questioning, which are considered really important. Um, you know, so, it, but that movement is what's most essential because otherwise uh, it's just admiring something from afar. It's like saying, oh, yeah, that was nice. So it kind of reminds me of one of my teachers, Manindra in India, who said to me once, the Buddha's enlightenment solved the Buddha's problem. Now you solve yours. <laughs> and it was perfect, you know? It was like, oh, he thinks I can solve my problem. And, and that movement to try rather than hang back and defeat or say, oh, yeah, next year or whatever, you know, that movement to try is what I was calling faith. Giving over your heart. Tell me what that means. It's a very powerful phrase. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, first of all, recognizing you have a heart, that there's a core of your being and that its offering is extremely valuable. Um, it's not negligible and and it's powerful. And so whether that's to um, a, a kind of uh, theme for life, like, you know, I am devoted to trying to bring goodness into this world and, and – and that's more important to me than anything. And so I won't always succeed, you know, but I I don't actually ever completely lose touch with that that understanding. Um, you know, maybe I forget for a while or I get overwhelmed or exhausted or something, but it's like, oh, right, that's what my life is about. Mm -hmm. So I think for a, a, a lot of people, there's a sense of I've given over a portion of my heart <laughs> to this, but I've kept a little portion over here mm -hmm. that I'm just kind of, it's in reserve. I'm not really giving it over exactly. I'm just kind of keeping it over here for like uh, times when I might need it for myself, something, something like that. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think that's the quandary of generosity. Do we ever end up with less through, through giving? That's something to check out, you know? That's the experiment. Like, are we are we depleted? Are we bereft? Um, if so, really, was it generosity, or was it something else, something more manipulative, or with more expectation, or something like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you a direct question: Have you one hundred percent given over your heart, and if so, to what? Um, I'd say a little hard to say one hundred percent. So I'll. I'll I'll be a little cagey around that. But. I used math and everything there, you know? Um, that, in some funny way, goes back to the introduction to real change. Um, because I wrote the entire book. Uh, I turned it in. I wrote the entire book pre-pandemic. I turned it in, um, I think it was December. It might have been early January of 2020. I went to California for a month. Um, I came back to New York March 2nd, and the world was seeming weird, you know, very weird. And uh, the book was supposed to come out in June, and they postponed it to September 2020. So um, a friend of mine was reading the book to excerpt it for something, and, and he said, you know, pre-publication, pre and he said, you know, I like the book a lot, but I kept reading those examples and thinking that's what made you anxious? Wait till you see what's coming. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the publisher and, and I asked if, since you are postponing the pub date, could I write a preface, like to try to 
recontextualize um, what I'd written in in what well, was current reality. And they said yes. And so the overriding question for me in trying to write the preface was what's still true? You know, my year looks nothing like I thought my year was going to look. I'm, I'm stuck in Barry, Massachusetts instead of New York. I'm not traveling. I'm not seeing anybody. You know, it's like uh, expectations are shattered. People are terrified. People, I mean, especially in New York, you know, at that point, were like really sick often and dying and losing people. And um, I thought, what's still true? Like, what am I counting on? What what's holding me up? What can I rely on? And, and that was a tremendous process all in and of itself. And what I used in, in that introduction as an example was um, the Buddha's kind of quirky statement uh, and her quirky in a way uh, that hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. And the reason I considered it quirky was because this is like Mr. Impermanence, you know, and all of a sudden he's saying this is an eternal law. Um, and that is, of course, something to struggle with and, and try to understand. And there's so many situations in which I think, not here, come on, you know, like that can't be so here. But I actually do believe it's true. Um, and I think if we're going to look for something intact in this world that's not broken by all these changing circumstances, it can be something around love and our ability actually to to love and i think it's it's um it's a potential we have in any situation you've been listening to insights at the edge in 2013, Dr. Lissa Rankin's best-selling book, Mind Over Medicine, ignited a revolution in the way we look at mind-body healing. But when letters about miraculous healings and spontaneous remissions started pouring in from readers, she realized she still had more questions than answers. Certain that if she looked hard enough, she would discover the science behind why and how we heal. Dr. Rankin embarked on a decade-long journey, bringing her medically trained eye to healing practices from around the world. Her new book, Sacred Medicine, is the result of that quest. You can learn more at thesacredmedicinebook.com. And now, back to Insights at the Edge. Okay, I'm going to keep going for a moment with this notion of giving over one's, I'm going to use the word now, whole, one's whole heart. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know just inside you mm -hmm. what that feels like and kind of what that is as a practice, if you will. I think it feels like um, alignment. You know, it feels like harmony. It's like something in me that says, oh, that's right, that's right. Um, and everything else is sort of trying to slip around it or avoid it or, you know, it's like hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. And you think, come on, you know, look at how they're behaving. You know, you can't mean here or, and then of course there's a lot of what I might call misconception about love, you know, it weakens you. It means you're just approving. You're not taking a stand. I don't think it means any of that, you know, but it can feel that way. So then there's a lot of fear and, and uh, a lot of division. But when I get there, it's just like, all right, this is right. And it doesn't cost anything. That's, that's why I said that about generosity. You know, it's not like I'm left with less. You know, I noticed as you described that giving over of our whole heart as a kind of alignment, I sat up straight. I started feeling um, really good. And all that happened was I sort of took in what you were saying, you know. I'm going to move on to uh, the third theme that I'd like to pull out and highlight from Real Change, 
which is uh, moving from grief to resilience. Mm -hmm. And in reading Real Change, I learned a, a lot more about you, Sharon, and your early life than I knew previously. I didn't know how much suffering mm. was part of your early life. I wonder if you would be willing to share a little bit about that. And if you would, how grief in some ways formed you as a young person and even continues to inform your teaching. Yeah, well, actually, it's interesting you say that because Faith, of course, the book is like my autobiography. And, and so it's the most explicit and detailed um, rendition of my of my early life. And the audio uh, form of it is only available mm -hmm. when it sounds true. So yeah, uh, that, was, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, greatest sorrows of my life were in my, you know, childhood when uh, my parents split up. They got divorced when I was four. My father disappeared. I lived with my mother. She died when I was nine. I went to live with my father's parents, whom I hardly knew. Um, my grandfather died when I was 11. My father came back. He, he hadn't come back even when, you know, I went to live with his parents, and he was, you know, really troubled and really out of it by then. And um, he took an overdose of sleeping pills maybe six weeks into that visit when I was 11 after his father died and uh, disappeared into the mental health system where he lived for probably another 20 years, you know, whether in a nursing home or a hospital or, you know, VA hospital or something like that. And um, my family being who they were, you know, of course I was told it was an accident. He forgot. He had already taken a pill, so he took another pill. And it's only when I was in college all those years later that I thought, wait a minute, you don't sort of accidentally have a mishap with medication and end up in a psychiatric hospital, do you? You know, so um, I went to college when I was 16. and went to, I went to India when I was 18. So you can see the direct line of, I was actually in my, Asian philosophy course as a sophomore in college where um, they were talking about the Buddha and they were talking about, of course, his tremendous emphasis on suffering, the suffering in life. And, and for me, it translated into, you're not so weird. You're not so different. You actually belong. You know, this is a part of life. It's not just you. So it was like the most liberating thing I'd ever heard. And and then I heard that there were methods, there were techniques, there were practices you could do to be a lot happier. And, and I was going to college in Buffalo, New York. I looked around Buffalo. I did not see it anywhere. And the university had an independent study program where if you created a project they liked, you could go anywhere in the world and theoretically for a year. And uh, I created a project. I said, I want to go to India and study meditation. And they said, okay. So off I went, and I left in uh, 1970, the beginning of the fall semester. I began meditating in January of 1971. Uh, and, and that sense of belonging um, through the acknowledgement of suffering has been a theme of my life ever since, because I see it everywhere, you know, that uh, we meet on a certain level, But it's actually at that level, you know, spoken or unspoken, that we really find one another. Mm -hmm. And of course, Deepama, who was my teacher, who told me to teach, and that was in 1974, um, when I, I went to visit her in Calcutta, because I was coming back to the States for what I was convinced was going to be this very short visit before I went back to India for the rest of my life. And she said, when you go back, you'll be teaching. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. And I said, no, I won't. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I can't teach. And, and then she said, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach. Mm -hmm. So that was, my, that was my blessing. And, of course, the funny part is looking back, she didn't say, your realization is so vast. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should teach, or, you know. Your scholarship is so extraordinary. It was like, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach. 
Okay, let, let me ask you a couple questions. First, just uh, quickly here. You went to college when you were 16. Is that because you were like a super smarty pants or something? Uh, I was smart. I was a chief chairman and also it was the New York City public school system. Uh huh. Where they, they did tend to have people skip grades. Okay. So here, Deepa Ma says you're going to teach because you understand suffering. And I'm going to ask you just a really basic 101 question here, Sharon. Buddhism 101. Somebody who says, you know, I, of course, I've heard people say, you know, the Buddha said, all life is suffering. I don't get it. I mean, sure, there's suffering, but there's a lot of things that aren't suffering. I don't get it. Why say all life is suffering? I don't get that. Right. Well, it doesn't mean that in that sense, in that quotation, it doesn't mean suffering as, you know, dreadful pain or trauma or the ways we might use the word. I mean, that is a part of life and that is something we experience in different degrees, but there's also a kind of suffering. It's not uh, so intense and, and immediate. It's almost kind of like poignancy, you know, it's like, I don't know how this happened. You know, like I am asked to enter my year of birth in online and I have to scroll for like an hour and a half and <laughs> I don't understand, you know, where did my life go? And, and and there's even a more subtle level, you know, where it's sort of like you have a friend and you would do anything to have them suffer less and you can't make it so. Like no one's invented the chip where we can implant it in someone else's brain while we're holding the remote control and we can say, cheer up or stop drinking. It's just yeah. life, life's not like that. And so there are kind of layers and layers and layers of subtlety to it. Mm -hmm. So I, I've heard this distinction between, you could say, avoidable suffering, suffering we don't really have to be having, and suffering that's unavoidable. And I'm curious what you think of that distinction and how we know in any moment in our experience, is this avoidable? Can I avoid this? Is this secondary suffering or is this just like pure real suffering? Well, they're all real, I think, unfortunately. <laughs> they all hurt. But I think... Um... Yeah, I think we can know. I mean, people struggle. I'll struggle. Everyone struggles with the words, trying to figure it all out. Like some people, I think it was probably Stephen Levine originally who said, uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Or you can yeah. say, it depends on how you're using the words. And I sometimes I call it, I say suffering happens. It's like we feel what we feel. Or one of my favorite sayings is something's just hurt. They hurt. It's not because you have a bad attitude. It's not because you need to like elevate your thinking and it's not because you're resistant. It's like something's hurt, but what we don't need is extra suffering. And I think we can tell the difference. I can tell the difference. That's my question. How can you tell what's extra suffering? Well, I, I sort of know my patterns so well. It's like when I have the thought, I'm the only one right. who ever experiences this in whatever form, maybe not so elemental, but it's there. I, you know, I feel isolated. I feel I'm the only one. No one could ever understand this. No one could ever conceive of what I'm going through. That's, that's an add on, you know, that's an old, old tape or a kind of, um, shame. Like I should have been able to stop this. I've been meditating for an hour. I've been meditating for three weeks. I've been meditating for 50 goddamn years, you know, <laughs> like, why is this still arising? Uh, and which is also forgetting where our power really lies, which is not in the question of whether something comes up or not. It's in the question of how we deal with it, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's certain things I can just recognize that are, um, where something great happens, the wondrous, beautiful, fantastic thing happens. And uh, that voice that arises in me, they'll say, it's never going to happen again or it can't be real, or uh, whatever it is, you know, to diminish the experience. And so a question of skill is really, how do you relate to that voice? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's like the years of training. It's like, uh, if you say that's your inner critic, you know, sometimes we say, give it a voice, give it a, a wardrobe, give it a persona, give it a name. And then see how you relate to it because the relationship is everything. So you hear that voice that says it's never going to happen again. 
can you say, you know, have a seat, have a cup of tea, chill, you know, like just don't work so hard. Are you crazy critic? You know, just like be at ease. Mm -hmm. Now I want to dig in here a little bit and I don't want to get too um, bogged down in the language. However, I have worked with different teachers uh, at Sounds True who are very much like the point of the path is the end of suffering. Mm -hmm. And that is possible. It is possible to live Mm -hmm. without suffering at a certain point. And, and yet when I hear you talk about, you know, some things just hurt once again, I don't want, I mean, maybe there's no way to avoid getting into the language of it all. Maybe what that teacher is trying to point to is, yes, there's pain, but you don't have to really get, you just let the hurt be there. How do you see it, Sharon? Well, I think that, I think it's so different when we're not lost in those add-ons. Right. You know, that you could, I think, genuinely say it's a completely different experience, even though um, resentment or, you know, a little tinge of bitterness or something may arise, you know, but you're not invested in it. You're not lost in it. You're not taking it to heart. It's not consuming you. That's a very different experience. But I, you know, I I really take a stand on something that's just hurt because I've seen the opposite so much, you know, where people are confounded. I've been meditating all this time and, you know, then they tell you some horrible thing that happened, you know, and then I don't understand why I'm not calmer, you know, because that was horrible. You know, you have been through a genuine tragedy and why are you blaming yourself for, you know, for feeling something about it? I've seen a lot of that too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have two more themes I want to touch on and then a very important topic I want to cover too. So I'm going to keep this uh, train, this real change train to chewing here, which is allowing joy. This really spoke to me on the path of being a real change maker. You write about how if we titrate, if we don't just stay with what's hard, that it enables us to persevere. So I wonder if you can speak more about that and the role of joy. Well, I think titrating, interestingly enough, is also uh, an element in things like trauma therapy. You know, it's it's realizing that um, it's almost like saying energy is a, is a genuine commodity or, or resource and that uh, if you sort of stay with what's hard endlessly, you're going to get exhausted. And it's just not going to be the optimum environment in which to learn something or move on or develop a different relationship. And this goes back to um, kind of an understanding from the Buddhist teaching where he said um, that suffering itself is not the point. Like suffering isn't redemptive. Suffering is not grace in that system. But how we relate to suffering could be. You know, and, you know, are we with what's hurting with compassion for ourselves, for example, rather than judgment um, or criticism? And we need energy to do that. If you're exhausted, you just, you're not going to get there. And so we have to sort of balance ourselves to the best of our ability all along. And, and that's really important. And part of that is taking in the joy. And, you know, anybody who knows activists knows how hard it is or, or even caregivers, like the ones who care for others to, to sort of receive is not that easy. And, and to sort of feel the abundance of life and the, the joy that's available, um, but if we don't do that, then it, it, it is exhausting. I mean, a day is exhausting, you know, mm-hmm. between everything we need to do and then, uh, and uh, you know, the ways we kind of get beaten down and, and frustrated and, and we need some balance. Mm-hmm. Do you have a practice yourself that's like Sharon Salzberg's I'm going to open to joy practice? Oh, to joy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it starts, I mean, both, you know, uh, from the Buddhist point of view and being a New Yorker, uh, it starts with what's holding me, looking at what's holding me back, you know, like um, 
oh, this isn't as good as it was last year or, you know, whatever the thought is, or this could be better or um, I wish I had more time to look at the sunset. It's not fair, you know, and being able to release those thoughts and remind myself just just be here with what is good. And And it's also and a lot of it has to do with simple things like sunsets or the sky something that evokes a sense of space, uh, being amused by people because we're also kind of funny. Um, you know, uh, taking satisfaction in something like writing. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I wrote that. Look at that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, because we get so afraid me too. Like, Oh, that's boastful or that's egoic or that's, gonna you know strengthen my ego or something like that but it's just like relax you know enjoy it yeah yeah okay the uh fifth theme living by the truth of interconnection and what i wanted to ask you about with this point in terms of real change is that it feels to me that it's not that hard to intuit to see to appreciate our interconnection. It's not that hard. I mean, uh, you use the example of looking at a tree and seeing the sky and the roots. And people, I think it's easy to get it, let alone if you've taken some kind of hallucinogen or something. This mm -hmm. web of life, we're all connected with. People get it. Mm -hmm. But actually living by it, translating mm -hmm. that, especially into the structural systems that we live in and all of the lack of equity that is part of the structures of our society, this is where I'm trying to understand for you how you bring it down to the earth mm -hmm. of how you actually live your life, not as a philosophical intuition. Well, that's why, you know, like you and I, when we've talked about the workplace, you know, and I've said that my favorite question um, in going into teach at a workplace is, how many other people need to be doing their jobs well for you to do your job well? Um, because really, you know, if it were not for the engineers or the house cleaners or whoever it is, our lives would not happen in such a smooth fashion. And so and maybe for me, some of that came also from the work with caregivers because they're often hidden, you know, they're like the hidden heroes. And I would look at those women, often women, not exclusively, but largely women working in the domestic violence shelters and and think, boy, if they weren't doing their job, this whole society would fall down, you know, but nobody thinks about them or pays them enough or appreciates them. So I make it a point to do that reflection, you know, if, uh, like with Thich Nhat Han, where he would urge, I mean, he was, every time I saw him, I think he held up some object in the air and would do this exercise, like he would hold up a piece of paper and say, now see the cloud, you know, because as you trace back, like what makes this paper, it, it's the elements that go into it. Or the last time I saw him, he held up a sunflower. This was in New York city. And he said, now see all the non sunflower elements in the sunflower. Once he held up a string bean, you know, and you would sort of imagine the farmers planting the seed and the creatures who live in the soil and, who harvested the crop, who transported it, who sold it to you. Suddenly you look at that string bean, it's like half the earth is there, you know? Um, and so I've kind of learned to actually do that as a reflection, do that as an exercise, especially, you know, in a, a non-equitable society, talking to people, um, you know, who are maintaining the infrastructure that I am counting on, but I never think about really, you know, uh, unless I'm, I mean, this is all a long time ago because I haven't been anywhere in two years, but you know, like unless I'm on a train and, and suddenly um, it gets stuck between DC and New York and, and suddenly the people who do the road repair and the train repair and the, they're very important to me, but otherwise it's like they're invisible. And so, both through loving kindness toward neutral people and just that reflection. I really try to, to remember how intricate this world is and how many people I'm counting on uh, for my happiness, for my well-being. 
Okay. Now, you, you mentioned in the very beginning of our conversation that you wrote Real Change for two types of people, mm -hmm. the caregivers, and then the second type, just a general person, that kind of person who, after doing compassion practice, walks out, sees a homeless person, and traditionally would have just given a dollar, now looks them in the eye, but then has a set of questions mm -hmm. that says, wait a second, I'm going back to my, I don't know, my really nice New York City expensive apartment. And this person isn't. And I just spent an hour meditating on our interrelatedness and our interconnection. And now I don't know what to do with myself exactly. I think I'm going to read Sharon's book. Okay. But what's the, the kind of deeper structural real change process mm -hmm. that this individual could start embarking on or, or at least looking into inquiring into how do you see that well i do think it's it's a question of inquiry it's like learning i want to set out to learn um i don't know anything about the housing policy of of my city uh, i don't know anything about what happened with deinstitutionalization you know of uh, mental health facilities, which used to be a very big thing in my life. Um, you know, how many resources were ever allocated for people to live in the community as opposed to just closing down a hospital and putting them on the streets. And I don't know anything about, you know, this history or I don't know anything about. Um, and, and you think, I want to find out. I just want to learn. You know, what is going on here? Where are my tax dollars going? Who's, in, who's making these decisions? How many people vote in those elections? you know, for these local uh, governance roles um, and then see where your heart leads you or see if there's something that you do want to participate in. But it starts with even caring to know and, and not having it stop at just the level of the human to human connection, because that is extraordinary and it's very important. But in some ways, it's, it's almost like the beginning. Mm -hmm. That caring to know, and then it seems like uh, taking actions and engaging our analytical capacities. That yeah, we, yeah. Like we have to be willing to actually, uh, it's it's work. It's real work what you're describing. Yeah. But it's, it's almost like um, just go deeper, you know, look for causes and conditions to the degree you can discern them. You can find them out and, um, and one of the stories I tell in the book, you know, it's about this conference I was at where somebody um, was talking about uh, teaching literacy in Texas and in prisons. And it was like noble and amazing in these places. I mean, I've been teaching occasionally in prison. It's not an easy place to be. And, you know, so on one level, it was all great. It was all very noble. And then somebody... And the audience stood up and said, um, I don't know how you can be doing that in Texas and not in any way confronting the kind of racism that's at the core of the criminal justice system there. And it was like a moment, you know, it was like, oh, because, of course, that was also true. And it's like we want solutions. We want and I'm not putting down the efforts of the people teaching literacy because I think that was like extremely good and hard to do. But we, if we actually want solutions, we have to look deeper. We have to look into causes and conditions. Otherwise, we're just going to go around and around and around and around. Okay. The last thing I wanted to ask you about is something you already touched on. And it was when you were talking about joy and talking about what you might need to let go of. And I'm wondering in general, to be a real change maker, what your thoughts are about what we might need to let go of. Oh, well, isolation, you know, I think I think a certain kind of certainty as well. You know, I think that the spirit of inquiry is really important. And uh, we see so much positionality and, um, and I think there's there's also a certain, I think we need to let go of some extremes, you know, and understand a place in the middle. So when I say let go of positionality, I don't mean 
let go of principle, you know, and a sense of right and wrong. Because I think there is right and wrong. Uh, you don't have to be highly judgmental about it or consider yourself always right and the other people always wrong. But th I think there is, you know, there's actions, there's beliefs, there's ways of being that are extremely harmful uh, and damaging. And, and I don't think that my goal is not to sort of give credence to them, you know, <laughs> as though, well, all beliefs are just beliefs, you know. And, um. But at the same time, you know, to understand causes and conditions that people uh, come to understandings in different ways. And that uh, it sort of it comes back to me sometimes to this quotation from Maya Angelou, who said something like, um, when you know better, you do better. You know, and that it's kind of understandable how each of us at different times in different ways kind of gets stuck. And that we need to know better in order to do better. Now, Sharon, just to conclude, I hear you're working on a new book from Real Change, your previous <laughs> book, to a new book called Real Life. Yeah. Can you give us just a, a brief preview? What's Real Life going to be about? Real Life. Um, real Life uh, is about moving from contraction, narrowness, um, to expansion or openness, and is based on, uh, in lockdown, you know, uh, I watched this program called Saturday Night Seder, which I absolutely love. I don't know if it's still up on YouTube or not, but it was my Seder of the year, you know, because I wasn't going anywhere. Um, and it reminded me that if you take all of that symbolically and not in terms of geopolitics or um, anything like that, the word that is translated as Egypt actually means a narrow place. And so the whole Seder is symbolic for moving from being locked in and, and constrained and, and narrow to, to being open and free and uh, so it's all about that. How do I see that that progression? It starts and ends with the Seder. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, we'll talk again about uh, real real life in a couple of years, <laughs> yeah. uh, God willing. Yeah. yeah. I've been speaking with Sharon Salzberg. We've been talking about real change. She's written a book with that title. Mindfulness to Heal Ourselves in the World with Sounds True. Sharon's also written a book on the force of kindness about loving kindness meditation. She's created several audio programs with us, including the audio book of her book, Faith, an online course with Joseph Goldstein on insight meditation. And she's also one of the wisdom teachers participating in Sounds True's inner MBA program teaching on loving kindness at work. Sharon, always great to be with you. You increase my IQ. No better to do better. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always great to be with you, truly. Thanks for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at resources.soundstrue.com backslash podcast. That's resources.soundstrue.com slash podcast. If you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I absolutely love getting your feedback and being connected. Sounds true. Waking up the world.